The Lord is here. Good evening. Good evening. Well, it's great to see all of you. <laughs> also, can I say a, a very good evening to all those in the overflow at the moment. We hope that you're experiencing the Lord like we are, and I know you are, and we're sure you are. Should we all give them, uh, may the Lord be with you, or something like that? Let's give them all, Lord, the Lord be with you. Let's say it to the overflow people. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And uh, I'd just like to say hello to my son, Simeon. Hello, Simeon. And I'd like to say hello to my son, Michael. Hello, Michael. And to my delightful wife, Killy. It really is great to be here. I hope that you've been having a great time and enjoying each other, but more than that, enjoying God. This is my fifth year here. It's always a joy to be part of New Wine, and I think for what for me, one of the joys is actually with uh, the Bishop, Bish David and uh, Barry Kissel. I mean, they're like two cuddly teddy bears, aren't they? <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> They're so kind of laid back, aren't they? It, it really is quite refreshing. Do you know, one day, uh, Barry was preaching at this service, and uh, it was Mothering Sunday, and David was sitting on the front row, and uh, Barry got up and he said, I spent the best years of my life in the arms of another man's wife. Pause. My father's wife. And everyone laughed, thought, that's great, great, great. Now, of course, David being there on the front row, he thought, that is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And I'll use that one tonight when I'm preaching. So he went to preach, and uh, he started off his talk, I spent the best years of my life in the arms of another man's wife. Pause. And then there, he went and had a blank. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, and I can't remember who. Oh. They are ever so refreshing, aren't they? They really are. And I know that a number of you have been enjoying uh, Barry and Mary's uh, marriage seminars, but you may have not heard them tell you this story, that uh, Mary was having some problems. And uh, eventually Barry took her to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist uh, tried to work out what was causing Mary's problems and then eventually the psychiatrist just had this kind of like brainwave and he got out of his chair and he walked over to Mary he embraced her he gave her a kiss he stepped back and a smile just beamed in her face the psychiatrist turned to Barry and said sir that is all she needs and Barry looked at his diary and said I think I can bring her in on Tuesdays and Thursdays <laughs> They are, they're ever so refreshing and tonic. Do you know the first year I actually had to speak here, I, uh, well, in fact, no, the first year I came, I came with my wife and children, well, one then, and uh, we registered, and then we got all of our bump. We went back to the caravan to look and see what was happening, and uh, I found that J. John was preaching at one of the celebrations, but they forgot to tell me which was uh, quite interesting really, wasn't it? When you've got like two or three days to think it through and prepare it. Um, but this time I've actually had a little bit longer. I've had about nine months to think this one through. And I sometimes think maybe it's better just to have two or three days. <laughs> I feel as though I've been pregnant for nine months, you know? As I said earlier on, as I greeted my family, um, I've been married for 10 years now. I'm first-generation Christian, 
I wasn't brought up as a Christian, and I became a Christian as a student in London in 1975. But my wife comes from generations of Christians. Both maternal and paternal grandparents were all missionaries. In fact, my wife's grandfather was an evangelist called Dick Reese, who had a brother called Tom Reese, who were very influential in evangelism. And my wife's maternal grandparents were missionaries in Burma. And everyone, the parents, they're all missionaries, all vicars, the whole lot. Do you know? And I'm first generation. And it, I think it must have been interesting up in heaven because I got thrown out of my home when I became a Christian because my parents really didn't want to have anything to do with me because it was anathema that I had actually become a Christian. And I think there could have been a conversation up there in heaven with the angels and the Lord, and the angels saying, oh, you know, look at J. John, you know, he's become a Christian, and he's been kicked out of his home, and he's struggling. Well, why don't we give him a, a wife and give him someone who's got some good stock in her? And uh, so uh, I love my wife, and it's, uh, it's great to have her encouraging and supporting. Our two children, Michael and Simeon, are probably my most stimulating theological uh, partners that I have. I said to my, by the way, I've asked for permission to use these stories. Um, I said to my son, Michael, he's six. I said, wash your hands, Michael. He said, no. I said, wash your hands. He said, why should I? I said, because, Michael, we've actually had this conversation before, and I've explained to you it's germs, germs. And he slouched by the toilet door, and he went, germs and Jesus, germs and Jesus, and I've never seen them. <laughs> so. My son, Simeon, he's, he's four. And uh, his favorite song is Shine, Jesus, Shine. The only problem is, is that he sings it when he's in the toilet, switching the light switch on and off. Shine, Jesus, shine, Jesus. And then the spirit, spirit flow bit, he's running the taps, you see. So a uh, bit of an adventure there. Today I took my son Simeon to the loo, and he's sitting there, and he says, Daddy, I said, yes. He said, um, he said well, what does God look like? So I was thinking, oh dear, this is interesting, isn't it? And uh, so I tried to explain to him a little bit about what God looked like, and I told him a little bit about Jesus. And he said, no, Daddy, no, no. I had a dream last night, Daddy, and I know that God is filled with light. What can you say to a four-year-old? <laughs> God is moving amongst us, and he's moving amongst all the age groups. God is good. God wants to meet us. And that's the excitement and the truth of the Christian message, that God wants to communicate with us and communicate in all sorts of ways. I want us tonight to look at a family crisis. If you've got your Bible, would you please turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. And it says, Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. 
Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he meant. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Mary and Joseph, who lost Jesus Christ, literally. The mistake was easily made. The pilgrims going home in groups of men and women, one at the front of the journey, one at the back of the journey, perhaps even separated by one hour's walk. Each parent imagined that their son was in the other group. Of course, it could easily happen. There is no hint of criticism here. Mary thinks that Jesus is with Joseph. Joseph thinks that Jesus is with Mary. But Jesus is neither with Joseph or Mary. Only when they stopped their journey at night and they got into family groupings did they realize their loss. Imagine the conversation, Mary and Joseph. Where's Jesus? Well, I thought he was with you. Well, I thought he was with you. Well, where is he then? Well, he's not with me. Well, he's not with me either. Oh, no. <laughs> now, Killy and I, we went shopping with Michael when he was, I think he was four. We went into Virgin Superstore in Nottingham and we lost him. One second he was there, next second he wasn't there. And you know, your heart, it kind of, it just sinks, doesn't it? Oh, and Virgin Superstore in Nottingham is quite, it's two floors, it's very big. I mean, you're just running around as, like a chicken with his head off. You know, you're just running around, running around to try and, you know, where's my kid? And you're, you're looking all through the posters. You're saying, have you seen my kid? Have you seen my kid? Upstairs, I went to the lady, she was serving people. I said, please, get onto the tannoy and say, Michael John, Michael John, your daddy's looking for you. You know, that sense of desperation, that sense of, where is he? Has someone stolen him? Oh, no, you know, what could happen? You think the worst of the situation. And the poor kid got stuck behind some posters. <laughs> but the worst kind of that situation, we've seen it, haven't we, on our televisions, where a child is missing. The parents are interviewed on television, and our hearts go out to them. They're desperate, they're anxious, they're guilty. How could we have allowed this to happen to our child? How could we have allowed our child to get lost? Mary and Joseph must have felt a bit like that. How could we have let him get lost? Are there others like Mary and Joseph? traveling the Christian road and believe Jesus is with them, but when night comes, we discover that he's not with us. And I, I, I joked earlier on about I've been carrying this message for nine months. I have, you know, from the day whenever I get invited, the moment I accept a particular invitation, I start thinking about it. I start praying about it. And I've been thinking about losing Jesus for nine months now. This whole idea, and I, I, I feel as though it's a word for us. Traveling along the road, we think he's with us, but when the night comes, he's not here. Now, what I'm talking about is not losing our salvation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about losing sight of Jesus, who he is, stepping outside of his presence, thinking and deluding ourselves that we have been traveling with him only to have our eyes opened and find out that he's not there. I wonder how many people in the middle of the night have looked at their partner in bed and there they are physically, 
but emotionally they've lost them. Somehow they've become very distant. If that can happen in our homes, then it can happen with Jesus. We presume he is with us, but we've walked on without him. And if Mary, his mother, and Joseph, his stepfather, can lose him, so can we. A 12-year-old boy visiting the great city. I mean, if you're visiting a huge city with thousands of people, there must have been over, over, well, over 100,000 people there that particular period. Over. And you're going there. I mean, you'd have some kind of instructions, wouldn't you? You'd say, Mary might say to Joseph, look, if we got separated, look, don't worry, meet you at the clock tower. You know, you'd say something like that. You'd have a contingency plan. I mean, he's only 12 years of age. You've seen, you've seen haven't you seen the film? Home Alone? <laughs> well, you know what could happen. He's only 12. Yet the impossible did happen. You see, it's not just sinners who lose Jesus. Saints can lose Jesus too. It's not just sinners who lose Jesus. Saints can lose him too. The most unlikely people in the Bible, Mary and Joseph, lost Jesus. And I think, as I've reflected over these last nine months, I think that there are three places where there is a danger of us losing sight of Jesus Christ. One, in our individual lives. Two, in the church, and three, in the world. One, in our individual lives. Two, in the church. Three, in the world. And the Bible warns us of places and times where we are in danger of losing Jesus. For just as Mary and Joseph lost Jesus in the most unlikely of places, the holy city of God, so today we can lose Jesus in the most unlikely places, in our individual lives. Please turn, if you have a Bible, to Revelation 2, verse 2. The words of Jesus to the Ephesian church, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. The church in Ephesus is praised for many things. Their deeds, their hard work, their purity, rigorous scrutiny of those who claim to be apostles, their perseverance and endurance. But they still had lost the most important thing. They had forsaken their first love. They let go of their first love of Jesus, which they had when they heard, first heard, and responded to the good news. How easy that is to do. How easily we think we've been saved. We've received the Spirit. And we're going on with the Lord. And maybe the Spirit's warning to the church today as in Ephesus, have we lost our first love, should be taken seriously. Can we remember our first love for Jesus when we first became a Christian? Do we still love him as much? Are we still amazed by his love? 
Or have things come in and taken a share of the love we once had for him? The Bible warns us there could be many things. Money, success, running after the love of others, security, materialism, that could cloud our vision of him and our love for him and his rightful place in our lives. Do you know, as, as an evangelist speaking to many unbelievers, I often might say, you know, as you get into your automatic mode, you know, we're talking to people who are not Christians, you know, we're in a rat race. We're in a rat race. And the problem with the rat race is, is that even if you win the race, you're still a rat. And it's all very nice and all that sort of thing. But do you know something? We in the church, we're in a different rat race. And so on one level I'm saying to these unbelievers, do you realize you're in a rat race, and yet here I am I in the church, I just moved out of the secular rat race into the ministerial rat race. It's just two different rat races, that's all it is really. And it's dawned on me really that the, the race that I'm in so often and the hassles I'm in in the church need reviewing, need the cleansing of the spirit. Could the Spirit be saying to us that some of us, parts of our church, have lost sight of Jesus? Our focus of him is blurred. We can so easily lose Jesus in the mundane course of our own spiritual lives. Secondly, we can lose Jesus in the church, in the religiosity of the church. It was something of which Jesus accused the religious leaders of the time. John 5, 39. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. The very people who were the most religious could not see Jesus. It's very easy when we hear Jesus saying things like this to think he's talking about someone else. But what about us? A bishop was involved in a discussion program on the BBC with an atheist and a Jew. And the subject was Jesus and Christmas. After 15 minutes, one of the panelists said, we can leave the question of Jesus aside now because we have dealt with him. And the bishop said, oh no, you can never deal with Jesus. Augustine tells of a vision of seeing a little boy at a beach scooping up the ocean thimbleful by thimbleful, and emptying it out on the sand. And then he sees an angel who tells him that this boy will have emptied out the entire ocean long before Augustine has exhausted what can be said about God. I think there's a real truth there. Often we think in the church, we've dealt with Jesus. He's our risen, ascended, and glorified Lord. He reigns on high. And some of our songs reflect this view. But in the middle of all this, we can lose the real Jesus. Do I love to preach, or do I preach because I love? That's quite a hard question. I address that to all the other preachers here. Do we love to preach, or do we actually preach because we love? Do we sometimes get so caught up in worship that we forget the one we're actually worshipping? Are we so obsessed sometimes with gifts that we forget the giver? Are we so kind of intense about ministry that we forget the minister? 
I think so often I've realized in my own life I can get kind of trapped. There's a sense of going into automatic. This is what I do. This is who I am. These are the gifts God's given me. And in the process, somehow, somehow, just, just lose, just lose something, lose something. Have we lost Jesus? And in doing that, made him inaccessible to the rest of the world. Are we, as the church, reacting sometimes as the brother of the prodigal son reacted? I think our church has lost sight of the Jesus who offered salvation to all, no matter what they had done. And somehow we've made it all respectable, all worked out. And we react as the brother reacted when his father threw a party for his lost, rebellious brother. Do we let Jesus be Jesus? Do we hold Jesus up as our great hero? He is our hero. Or are we so fixed on our Christian heroes? Jesus is our hero. He's the one. He's the one I'm focused on. He's the one I'm trying to look at. He's the one I'm trying to reflect. He's the one I'm just, I'm just trying to be with and, and serve and do what he says. How different Jesus was. He was always in control. Isn't he fantastic? He was never manipulated. No one ever used Jesus. We can never just assume he is with us. That is what Mary and Joseph did. They were on a pilgrimage, a spiritual journey, but they lost Jesus. They presumed he was there. We should never just presume. Thirdly, we can lose Jesus in the world. One of those who passed by the man on the roadside from Jericho to Jerusalem was a priest. He was too busy to stop because he was going to the temple to do something spiritual. In the same way, the church often loses sight of Christ in the world. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, if that is true, and of course it's in the Bible, then if we neglect the poor, if we neglect the homeless, if we neglect the needy, if we neglect the hungry, then we neglect Christ. Have we lost sight of Jesus in the world? Mary and Joseph were rebuked by their 12-year-old son because they hadn't learnt that he would be somewhere other than where they thought he should be. And Jesus surprised them. And today, Jesus Christ still surprises us. He still surprises us today. He also says to the church, did you not know where I would be? I would be among the starving, the homeless, the battered women, the AIDS sufferers. That's where I'll be. And perhaps we have been like the two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. They were having a rough time. They had witnessed the execution of Jesus, and they thought that Jesus was gone. They were so wrapped up in themselves that their own problems that they never recognized Jesus when he drew alongside them. They walked with him and discussed at length with him, and yet they didn't really know who he was. They thought that Jesus was lost to them, and not even the presence of Jesus alongside them dispelled this thought. Even with their hearts burning within them, they didn't know that Jesus was there with them. They completely missed him. And Jesus chided them for their slowness to understand about him and where he should be and what he would be doing. How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe. Do you know, to lose Jesus is to lose everything.
If anybody here tonight is not a Christian yet, can I just say to you, to lose Jesus or never ever to have had Jesus is to lose everything. And I would encourage you to reach out to Jesus with whatever faith that you've got. You don't have to have a lot of faith. One day I was really down, all sorts of hassles were happening to me, and uh, I was reading the passage where Jesus says, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed. So I went to the, a, a, a place to find some mustard seeds, and I got the mustard seeds, and I opened the packet, it was in a health shop. I opened the packet, and I didn't know what a mustard seed was. They were tiny, absolutely tiny, and I burst it into tears. Now I know I'm Mediterranean, but nevertheless it was kind of, you know, <laughs> You know, and you can imagine, you know, Jesus saying to the disciples, hey guys, you know, and he puts one of these in Simon Peter's hand, massive fisherman's hand, and he says, if you had faith as big as that, and Simon Peter goes, whoa, what's this? What's that? And he says, if you had faith as big as that, you could tell that mountain over there to get out the way and come back later on. I mean, did he really mean that? No, what he meant was, you've got the faith, you've got the faith. Just exercise your faith. Pick up that little bit of mustard seed and put it in Jesus. And when you plant it in Jesus and you water it, it sprouts, it grows, it becomes a very strong tree, and then the birds come and nest on it. It's all very nice and exciting and warm and friendly. And I would commend to you and I would encourage you to pick up your teeny weeny bit of little faith and say, I don't have any other faith. Well, that's enough. Just take the bit that you've got and plant it in Jesus and say, I reach out with this teeny weeny bit. And if you're there, if this is real, I want to encounter you. There was a little girl. She was asleep in bed. Her parents were asleep. And during the night, there was lightning and thunder. And the girl woke up crying. And so the mother tried to comfort her and said, well, look, darling, I'll tell you what, why don't you come and sleep in our bed tonight? Because it's such a, you know, bad night. So the little girl goes into their bed, falls asleep. In the morning, the parents awake, they go down, and when they awake, the girl's sleeping. So they leave her in the bed, they go downstairs to get breakfast ready. A few minutes later, they hear the little girl crying. They think, what's up with her? They dash upstairs and say, darling, darling, what's the matter? She said, well, I woke up. I looked for mummy in the bed, mummy was gone. I looked for daddy in the bed, daddy was gone. I looked in my bed and I was gone. <laughs> Do you know, if we lose, if we lose Jesus, we lose ourselves. We lose our, we don't know where we are. We really don't know where we are. If we lose Jesus, how are we to find him again? One thing we must never do is what Mary did, and that is to blame Jesus. Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Now that is a human reaction. We wouldn't want to criticize Mary and Joseph, but we don't need to blame Jesus. It's never his fault. He doesn't move from us, we move from him. There are two things I'd like to say about this. If we think we've lost Jesus, if we're not quite sure, if our vision of him is cloudy, two things. One thing is to retrace our steps to the place where we lost him. That's the first thing. Mary and Joseph had to retrace their steps back to the place where they lost him in order to find him. That's the first thing to do, and that is a hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do, to retrace your steps back to that place, back to that committee you don't understand, back to that person that we don't like, back to an aspect of the church that we detest, back to the person who might be criticizing us, it's there where maybe bitterness and resentment may have begun and our vision of him began to get cloudy. The Holy Spirit examines our hearts and souls and says, what is the issue? 
is the issue to go back to the place where it began and to go with love and to go with forgiveness and to go with faith and to go with hope to the place where we lost him in our individual lives, in the church or in the world. We need to obey the call which the Hebrews heard 2,000 years ago. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's one thing. We may need to retrace our steps to the place where we lost him. Secondly, and, and is this, that God is looking for us. You know, I, when I first played hide and seek with my children, it was really fun. Because they came and said, Daddy, can we play hide and seek? I said, yeah, sure we can. So Michael says, well, Daddy, I'll tell you what. You count one to 20, and, and Simeon and I will go and hide underneath the bed, and you come and find us. <laughs> I mean, you really feel good, don't you? You think, oh, that's my boy. You know, he, 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 wants, he wants me to find him. He really wants me to find him. Jesus told a story. He said one day there was a shepherd. Now, in those days when he said that, his audience probably bursted out laughing. You see, it's like if I said there was an Irishman, a Scotsman, and a Welshman going through a tunnel. See? You know it's a joke. A joke's coming up. Now, in those days, they used to joke about shepherds because shepherds talk to sheep all day. That's why they joked about them, you see. So Jesus said there once was a shepherd. Ha, 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 ha. This shepherd had a hundred sheep. Now, you know this parable. One day, I actually heard somebody telling this story at a Sunday school. And I have to say, she was very good at communicating. Unfortunately, she got the story wrong. This is how she said it. She said, children, we've got a very sad story today. It's the story of the lost sheep. And the shepherd went out into the sheepfold and he counted the sheep. One, two, three, 96, 97, 98, 99. Oh dear, that doesn't sound right. Oh, there's one missing. Lassie, Lassie, come over, Lassie. Lass and Lassie, you look after the 99 and we'll go and look after the lost sheep. I mean, it's a lovely story, isn't it? And you're sitting there in your heart. And, oh, that's lovely. But Jesus didn't say it like that. He said, there once was a shepherd. Ha, ha, ha. He had a hundred sheep. A oh, hundred sheep. He went out into his sheepfold and straight away he knew that one of his sheep was missing. So he goes into the sheepfold. Zebedee, where are you? Well, he'd sprung off somewhere. He'd gone. You see? So, Jesus says he left 99 sheep in the wilderness. At that point, they're in hysterics. Ha <laughs> ha! Why? Because you don't leave 99 sheep in the wilderness. <laughs> Why? Because if you left 99 sheep in the wilderness, the wolves and the bears come and they gobble them up. You see? So they're all thinking, this shepherd's a loony. He's a loony. He left nine. That is the whole point of the parable. So he leaves 99 sheep in the wilderness and, and then he goes to look after the lost sheep. Zebedee, Zebedee, Zebedee. And then, Zebedee, Zebedee. See, how did you get lost? Well, you know how he got lost. Got four legs, isn't he? Actually, got lost. <laughs> The thing about it is that he wasn't even after anybody. I mean, he's gone off on his own. I mean, you can't even give him any credit for anything, can you? Now, what would you have done if you found the lost sheep? Honestly, be honest. Maybe with my Mediterranean kind of background, I'd kick his head in, I don't know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You stupid sheep, you stupid sheep. The other 99 didn't leave the fold. You left the fold. Why did you? No, no, that wasn't the version that Jesus gave. Jesus, he said, and the shepherd picked him up, picked him up, wrapped him around his neck. Would you have done that? <laughs> well, you know what those hills are like, and there's rabbits and other bits and pieces, and you pick up bits, and anyway, round his neck. <laughs> so he's got him on his neck, right? And then he's going back to the 99. No, he's not. He's going into town. He bumps into a friend. The friend says, Jacob, why are you so happy? He says, well, he says, I had a hundred sheep. I lost one of them. 
and I found it, let's have a party. And his friend says, what about the other 99? <laughs> oh! Oh! Now let me give you a modern parallel, a modern parallel, right? There was, there was this, um, this man from Somerset and um, Every now and again, this man had, a, had uh, what did he have? He had 25 pound notes. And they were very special 25 pound notes and he liked, to, he liked to count them every now and again. So one day, and he used to go to this hill because he had a special place there. So he thinks, this is the day. But that day was the windiest day that Somerset had ever seen. He gets up there, 5, 10, 15, 80, 85, 90, 95 pounds. <laughs> One fiver blows away. He leaves 95 pound on top of the mountain. <laughs> right. And he goes after one five pound note, running, running. 10 miles later, he gets his fiver. Oh, he's so happy, he's so happy. He pops into the village. A friend of him says, Edward. And he says, yes. He says, why are you so happy? He says, you know that hill over there? I was up there, I was counting my savings. And as I was counting, I had 125 pound notes. Once blew away, do you know I ran and I got it. And his friend says, Edward, what about the other 95? Ooh. <laughs> now you see, God, Jesus said that when he told the first one, I told the second to illustrate the first. But Jesus then went on and said, God's like that. Ooh. That. God's like that. God's like that. God's like that. God gave up everything everything in order to go out and seek the lost. So if you and I tonight are feeling, yes, I think I've lost Jesus, in the rat race of ministry, in, 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 in the church, or in my life, do you know, I think I've lost him. I love him, but I've lost him. I've been traveling along the road, and night has come. I, I've realized he's not with me. Two things. Can you go back to the place where you lost him? Secondly, he is looking for you and for me. He is looking for you and for me. And if we do that, Romans 8 verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I was playing with my son's Etch-a-Sketch the other day. What happens when you make a mistake with, your, with the Etch-a-Sketch? You flip it, you shake it, you turn it back over and you have a clean slate. Romans 8 verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is God's etch-a-sketch verse in the Bible. And he says, I want to wipe the slate clean. And if you think you've lost me, I'm thrilled you've discovered it because I'm dying to find you. It's a very simple message tonight. A very simple message that I think applies to individuals and applies to the church as a whole. And in a moment, I'm going to ask those of us here who feel that in the midst of our own Christian lives and Christian ministry, we've somehow lost him. For some of us here, it may be that you're feeling, I've lost my first love of him. I'm doing all sorts of Christian things, 
and I'm engaged in a lot of Christian activity, but I've actually lost my first love of him. And I need to fall back in love with Jesus. And I need to be picked up by Jesus afresh and held in his arms so that I can experience all that I know is true. And for those of you here tonight, you haven't even found Jesus. So it's not an issue that you had him and you lost him. You haven't even found him. I would urge you and I would encourage you tonight to reach out to him with the little bit of faith that you've got and say, I want to find you. Would you please stand? Let's just have a moment of quiet, a moment of silence, a moment to reflect in our own hearts. In a moment, I'm going to ask those of us here who feel that we've lost Jesus, we've lost our first love. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to, to get out of, those, out of your seat, out of the rows, into the aisles, where there will be people ready to pray for you specifically in this area that we have been talking about this evening. If you feel that's you, and you, you would like specifically tonight to respond in this particular way, would you please make your way out to the aisles now? And those of you near the front, come to the front here. Now, if people in the ministry team will just come and uh, come alongside these people who've come forward and just pray with them, ask them what they want the Lord to do for them and just begin to minister to them. Now, I hope if you've got to get children that you'll make your way out now move along whilst the people are standing up and I'm going to ask the rest of you to stay standing for a little while because there are a few other people who are going to come out I feel the Lord also wants to do some healing tonight I'm just going to feed to you some of the uh, conditions of people I believe the Lord has shown me and I'd like you to come out as well and these friends who are authorized to minister will minister to you I don't know why, but I, somebody has a little, crooked, a little crooked right finger. You've had that problem for some time. Hmm? Somebody has a, a polyps in the throat or up in the... Is it in the mouth area? A, a, sorry, a polyps in the soft palate. Somebody who was born with a misty right eye. They've never seen properly out of that right eye. I think it's a woman. Somebody also has a, 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 
a wound on the right leg below the knee uh, and they they've got hurt during this camp uh, during this conference time there's a woman here who has a uh, some problem with the right ovary there's another woman here suffering from cystitis and another one who has thrush there's a man who has a neck problem a man who has a neck problem and he can't turn his head properly to the right or to the left and that neck problem increases the pain across his left shoulder in fact there's several men in that condition there's also a man who has hurt his back during this conference you just come out someone who has itching in the right ear itching in the right ear now if, if these are you just move out and uh, come to the people who are ministering you may have to wait a little while somebody here has a swallowing problem somebody here also has a band across the forehead right across here it's not something you had all the conference but it's, you've had it you've begun to get it tonight actually it's intensified tonight in a way that it, worse than you've had it during the conference somebody has a, a physical condition uh, which affects the nerves in your hands and uh, it follows an accident a motor accident that you had some years ago but you know the two things you, you definitely know the two things are connected and the doctors have said there's nothing more they can do about it somebody has a hearing problem in the left ear can't hear properly out of that left ear I'm going to pronounce the blessing that will release you to go and some of those people to come out you know we have to clear this place by 9.30 anyhow this isn't that we're hurrying up on the ministry but I do want to be able to release people to come out to be prayed for and it helps if those of you who can move out can do that so father we want to thank you thank you for the word we've heard tonight thank you for the open hearts that have responded thank you for what you're yet going to do through the power of your Holy Spirit and now dear Lord dismiss us with your holy and heavenly blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, feel dismissed and move around.